Good evening. We read in Scripture something to the effect that if you see me mounting on a cloud into heaven, my mantle will fall upon you. And in another experience, the master asks his disciples, whom do men say that I am? And of course the answer is that men believe that you are a resurrected Hebrew prophet or something of that nature. Whom do ye say that I am? Speaking to those who had been with him as disciples for some time. Whom do ye say that I am? And Peter has sufficient illumination to answer, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And the Master assures him that he's blessed in realizing that and tells him that you haven't learned this through your mind or the senses, the Father within you, spiritual intuition, spiritual awareness, spiritual discernment, has revealed to you my true identity. The secret of spiritual living is this. If you can understand what it was that changed Moses from a shepherd from an ordinary man to a great and successful leader and liberator of his people. If you can understand what changed a Hebrew rabbi into the founder of Christianity, if you can discern what changed Saul of Tarsus from an active persecutor of the Christians to the leading apostle of Christianity, changed him from Saul of Tarsus to St. Paul, if you can discern that, you are more than halfway home in your search for God, for truth, for reality because you will then know that every man, every woman, as a human, is but the unillumined human, the unillumined mind, the unillumined soul or consciousness, and that it takes just a spark, a touch of something divine to bring that state of unillumined being into an illumined individual, one who may be a religious saint or a seer or sage, but not necessarily, because that spark of divinity may turn one into something great in other lines besides that of religious leadership. At any rate, to be able to grasp just this little truth, that there is within an individual something that can spark into life, something that can awaken, awake thou that sleepest, awake thou that sleepest, if you can realize that there is something within every individual, it really makes no difference where you are in consciousness at this moment. A manufacturer, a salesman, an actor, an actress, a thief, a woman taken or not taken 
in adultery. It makes no difference what you are, who you are, as of this moment, if only you can realize that there is that within your own self and within the self of every individual in the hospitals, in the prisons, in business, in politics, there is that which can be awakened, then you are already more than halfway home, halfway to the Father's consciousness, because this truly is the secret of the revealed truth of all ages. We can go back all long centuries before the Master, tens of centuries before the Master, and find that this truth was known, that an ordinary, everyday individual, everyone, has within himself this spark, this sleeping, slumbering giant that in one way or another or for one reason or another may be awakened. In modern history, we seem to find a pattern running throughout this entire world. And the pattern is this, that the very sins or diseases or lack or limitation into which we fall constitutes the step that lifts us into the awareness of our divinity. The greatest of the spiritual lights have come up through either sickness or sin or poverty and have been driven by these very experiences to the ultimate realization of their true identity. That is why there is more hope for those of us who are going through sin or disease or lack than there is for the person who is in average comfort physically, mentally, morally, or financially. It is for this reason that Scripture says that God has more pleasure in one sinner redeemed than in 99 of those who have never been in sin. It is for this same reason that we have witnessed the persecutors becoming the apostles. We have witnessed the woman taken in adultery being the mainstay, one of the mainstays of the spiritual ministry, one of the most faithful. And so we know this, that this work that is going on in the world today, work that is really and truly saving the world from the evils that beset it. And be assured of this, the world is being saved. Is being saved by those who have been driven the deepest within themselves to find that center and then reveal to others that which they have discovered. Naturally, because as you have just heard, I travel so much more than 60,000 miles since you saw me here last year. And every year for the past nine years, 35 to 60,000 miles a year, nine times in eight years to Europe, four times in eight years around the world. Because of this, I know perhaps more than you do the evils that are abroad in this world because I see them not only in our newspapers but in the newspapers of all the foreign countries that we visit. I come closer to the world problems than most people and surely more than the tourists. And so I know what these evils are and the depth of them and the danger of them. And yet I am saying to you tonight as I have said before do not fear any of these. 
Do not fear any of these. These are not evils that you are reading about in the newspapers. These are the breaking up of evils. The evils have existed this past century and a half when you haven't been aware of it. The evils have existed in uh, what you read about now as colonialism. The evils have existed in uh, keeping some races down and building others up. The evils have consisted in the biases and the bigotries of churches that haven't yet been extinguished. The evils have been going on for the past century and a half, but today those who have been in bondage are finding their freedom even though temporarily there is some bloodshed with it. But there was bloodshed too that gave this United States its constitution and its freedom. And if there hadn't been people prepared to shed some blood and some wealth, we wouldn't be enjoying the freedoms that we are today. And so it is that these wars and rumors of wars are not evil. They are the preparations that are going on. They are the experiences that are going on leading to the greater freedoms. And so it is that these biases and bigotries that have existed in the past in the churches are rapidly being wiped out. Churches all over this world are being reborn, are having new experiences, are opening themselves not only to uh, tolerance, which is a very bad word, not only to suffering it to be so now that there are Jews and Protestants and Catholics and uh, Orientals. Oh, no. No, now the churches more and more are opening themselves to the truth that will free this world within this century from all religious differences. They are opening themselves to the truth that there is only one God. Everyone pays lip service to the statement that there is only one God, but until very recently, nobody has believed it, except to believe that, yes, there is one God, but only we have God. Only we. And of course, since we are God's chosen people, we are taken care of. Or, since we have the only true God, only so and so and so and so. But the truth is this. There is but one God. There is no Hebrew God, and there is no Christian God, and there is no Oriental God. There is God. And as I travel and find myself in temples in Japan and China, as I find myself in churches in England, in Switzerland, in the United States, as I find myself talking, lecturing, in unity centers, new thought centers, metaphysical movements open and closed, I find this, a greater awareness of this, there is only one God. Now, on this subject, one God, hinges not only the freedom and the safety and the security of the world, because you will understand, of course, that the very moment, let us uh, here in this one room just acknowledge within ourselves, each one of us, yes, there is only one God, and you have fallen into a trap. Because you've now got to look around this room and acknowledge that we are all brothers and sisters. And it makes no difference whether you want to call us Jews or Gentiles, white or black, oriental or occidental, you have got to admit now, since there is but one Father, but one God, you have got to admit that we are brothers and sisters. And after you have acknowledged that, can we lie to each other, cheat, 
steal, defraud, falsely advertise, take advantage of? How can we and look each other in the eyes and say, my father is your father, you are my brother, you are my sister. Your, your whole human sense collapses and you acknowledge we are of one household. Just one household, that's all. And what belongs to one belongs to all because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And son, all that I have is thine. But we are that son and we are that daughter. We are that child. And do you not see then that with these days that are very soon upon us, when every church will acknowledge there is but one God and stop at that, that they will have made every man, woman, and child on this earth brothers and sisters and members of one household. Now, to us individually, this subject of one God is of even greater importance at this moment than it is to the people of the world because you have not chosen to follow a metaphysical or spiritual path. You have not chosen to come out from the orthodox thought. You have been called. You are not in this room because you were advertised for. You are not in this room because anyone specifically brought you here under any guise whatsoever, nor are you a member, if you are, of a Christian science church or a unity church or a new thought movement. You are not members of those or attendants of those because of your will, and don't ever believe that you are. You were called. You have not chosen me, I have chosen you. Only those who come to a certain period of preparedness in consciousness are led out of uh, where they may have been into a higher activity or thought and ultimately into the highest. And it comes about in this wise. Before the days of metaphysical religions in the 19th century, the god of this world wasn't a god at all. The god of this world was a myth. In uh, the Reader's Digest this month, April, and in the Los Angeles newspaper this week, the Episcopalian bishop is quoted this wise, the God that most adult Hebrews and Christians worship is more inadequate than the God the atheists deny. This is the God the world accepted until the middle of the last century, an inadequate God, a false image of God, a false concept of God. It would take too long for our purpose tonight to go back and trace all of this and prove it, but it is so. But in the middle of the last century, a light began to break and uh, another concept of God came into this world. As it uh, is proven now, that wasn't God either. But it was halfway toward God when God was taken down from a mythological heaven, when his nature was changed from Santa Claus who could give or withhold gifts 
and God was brought down to mind, we began to see the first light of truth in the modern age. Now, God is not mind and thought is not power as it was taught in the 19th and early part of the 20th century. But certainly it was a great step from that bearded gentleman who had a great big book and wrote down all of the good things we did to reward us and all of the bad things to punish us, but somehow or other didn't quite get, in, get around to that rewarding part. We got all the punishment that was coming to us and some that we didn't deserve, but so few of us got the rewards for the good to which we were entitled. But nevertheless, when we did, we got it from that suppositional God of giving and withholding. And so we came down to a God of mind. And at least we took off the beard and we brought him down from heaven and we got him a little bit closer to us than he had been and we began to discern a little more of his nature. And so it is, and I give you this now, for the first principle of spiritual living. To know him aright is life eternal. If you hope at all to attain some measure of spiritual wisdom, spiritual life, spiritual health, spiritual supply, spiritual happiness, you will have to make up your mind, or rather, you will have to accept in your mind that the first step will be to know him aright. Until you come to know God aright, you will not even be approaching the, the first step on the spiritual path. There is a reason for this. In the ancient Hebrew teaching, the ancient Hebrew teaching, going back centuries before the Master and up to the time of the Master, God punished the evil and God rewarded the good. And who are the good? Those who went to temple regularly, those who tithed with the temple, those who sacrificed doves or animals, those who spent days and days, hours upon hours, sitting in churches, temples, synagogues, those who made annual pilgrimages to the mother church, the mother temple. These were the good who were to be rewarded. And who were the evil? Well, as you remember, those who were caught in adultery were taken to the outside the city walls and stoned to death. Those who stole, those who violated the rules and regulations of the church received horrible sentences, horrible punishments, completely out of line with the degree of their sin. If every case was one of sin, and all of this represented an ignorance of the nature of God. Therefore, anyone who accepts the belief that God rewards the good and that God punishes the evil is in a state of spiritual ignorance and one that dates back into the ancient of ancient of days of the Hebrews and if we would like some measure of proof of this, let us move up to the days, the mission, and the ministry of Christ Jesus. And now what do we find? Well, evidently God doesn't reward us for all of these sacrifices because we are told God has no pleasure in your sacrifices. Evidently God does not reward us for spending all of our time in church because we're told, now you shall no longer worship in a holy mountain or even in this holy temple. 
shall worship in spirit and in truth. And as a matter of fact, the scribes and the Pharisees were the most religious Hebrews of their day. They were the ones who lived up to the letter of the law. And heaven help you if you were caught in even a minor violation. And yet the master said that your righteousness must exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. Not only this, this is pretty shocking. Jesus Christ acknowledged that John the Baptist was one of the greatest Hebrew prophets of his day. And then he turned around and said, but ye, the least spiritual of you, will get into heaven before John the Baptist. All of this human observances, all of this human good, th this is not spiritual because... This represents an ignorance of the nature of God. And then he taught the nature of God. Neither do I condemn thee. Let him who is without sin cast the first stone. Thy sins be forgiven thee. To the thief I will take you with me this night into paradise. There isn't an element or trace of punishment in God or from God. He never sent his son to earth to punish sinners or to threaten them with punishment or to tell them that they were going to fry before they were raised up. Ah, no. The master reveals to us a God truly of love, a God who knows no punishment, a God who says, though your sins are Call at this minute, a minute from now, you are white as snow. Only go and sin no more <clears throat> because you return to your previous condition. But at any moment of your life that you can agree that you have sinned and that you are turning to the light, in that moment, you have encompassed all of the centuries of purgatory, all of the centuries of punishment. You have wiped out of your life all penalty for your past offenses as quickly as the master forgave the woman taken in adultery, as fast as the master forgave the thief on the cross. That very speed sets you free. Ah, yes, if you go and sin again, you bring the punishment on yourself. But remember this, it does not say that God punishes you. You have brought this upon yourself. It is not God. It is not God. There is no sign of God doing anything but sending his beloved Son unto you that you may be forgiven that you may be raised up, that you may be redeemed, and even if you're in disease, that you may be healed. No indication there that your disease is because of your sin or because of your wrong thinking. Ah, oh, no, no. There's no reason for your disease except ignorance. And I, the Master Christ, am come that you might be free. There it is. I am come that ye might have life and that ye might have life more abundantly. Do you believe it? Do you believe he said it? Do you believe he meant it? Then the Christ has come not to punish, not to cause disease, not to have you die of disease, but that you might have life and life more abundant. That's the function of the Christ to forgive, to redeem, to heal, to raise. Once you acknowledge that, you have wiped out of your mind the image of that mythological God that was taught to the ancient Hebrews. The very moment that you accept 
that the presence of God in you or the presence of the Son of God in you or the presence of Christ in human consciousness is a redeeming agency, a healing agency, a purifying agency, a forgiving agency, in that moment you have come close to knowing him aright. You see, when you come to know God, you'll know that God is love. When you have a God of love, you won't have a human disciplinarian or a superhuman disciplinarian. You'll understand why the Master taught that we must forgive 70 times 7. Now, since we're still a little bit lower than the angels, can you not imagine how many times God must forgive? Supposing we do acknowledge now our sin and renounce it and find ourselves forgiven and pure, and supposing, supposing because of the hypnotism of this world, that we succumb next week again or next year. Well, please, not, let's not wear sackcloth and ashes. Please, let's not retire and think that we've become the unforgivable and the untouchable. Realize that this is only one of the times that you're to be forgiven again and again and again until you've been forgiven so often that there isn't even the possibility of any further relapse. And then you'll begin to understand God aright. Now, Scripture does say in many places that we shall fear God. Not being a scholar, I have no way of knowing what the original word was or what the original meaning of the word was that now appears as fear God. But one thing I have learned in 30 years of this work is that there isn't any reason to fear God at all. God isn't going to do anything to us but bless us. The activity of God in us is to heal, to redeem, to save, to forgive, to lift up, so let us try over again, 70 times 7 and 70 times 70 times 70 times 7. And so it is, then, that that word fear must have some other connotation. It must uh, either have been a mistranslation or it had a meaning of which we have no knowledge now. But as we understand the word fear, let us agree that you can't fear love. You can't fear love. You can't fear life eternal. You can't fear the power of resurrection. All of this is God. You can't fear a healing influence. You can't fear that which has created the beauties of this world. Now, to lose fear of God and fear of punishment is really and truly coming into a greater awareness of God than we have ever had before. And it gives us immediately a freedom. God is not responsible for any of the ills that have ever come into my life or yours. God is not responsible for any of the evils that are upon the earth. This would make of God a monster, no matter what his reason. So, to understand this lifts you out of that mythological God into an awareness, or a greater awareness, of God as God really is. When you acknowledge first that there is only one God, when you acknowledge next that this God is closer to you than breathing and nearer than hands and feet, when you acknowledge that the nature of this God is love, forgiveness, healing, harmony, peace, when you acknowledge that I, God, am come, that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly, all fear drops from your shoulder and uh, you leave God to run his universe while you begin to question yourself. Why then... Have I had discords and inharmonies? 
Why do I still have them? Oh, you'll find it a great relief to know and to remember that God has nothing to do with them, and so you can leave God out of your calculations. Don't even try to please God. Don't try to influence God to help you. Don't try to bribe God. Don't believe that God can be influenced to help you regardless of what you may do. Just let God alone to run his universe, and let's come down now to see what really is the trouble. I know that this book is going to be a shocker. I know that. I've sat on this manuscript for five years before allowing it to be published. I know that. Because it's going to tell you what I'm telling you tonight, just where our evils have come from, just why we suffer, just why it is we're going to continue to suffer unless we turn ye and live. The reason is also revealed in Scripture. As ye sow, so shall ye reap. That's the answer. There is a law, a law that we set in motion with every thought we think and with every deed we perform. Moses presented to us in the Ten Commandments the major sins that bring punishment upon us. Every time we violate one of those commandments, we set in, a law, in motion a law, a law that reacts upon us. I would like in this very minute to set many of you free who fear malpractice. I'd like you to leave this room completely free of that fear. No one yet has ever succeeded in malpracticing anyone but themselves. The law that they set in motion reacts upon them. not upon you. You have no need at any time to fear malpractice. You need have no fear what any individual can do to you. Any individual. For this reason, the evils that we let loose in the world are the evils that return to us. They do not visit themselves upon others, for there is a God. There truly is a God. Now, to know God aright, then, is to know that there is never a violation of any spiritual law in the entire kingdom of heaven or earth. It would be impossible to violate a spiritual law. It has never yet been done. But we, as individuals, we set in motion a law through the violation of the Ten Commandments. Oh, not only a violation of the Ten Commandments, it goes further than that. Because the Master thought the Ten Commandments were, uh, well, not too important. He, he gave no stress to the Ten Commandments at all. If you remember... He really only kept one of them and uh, discarded nine. So he thought very little of those Ten Commandments. To the one that he kept, he added another. And you'll see why in this next minute. When you love God, you can't help loving man. For God and man is one. I and the Father are one. God the Father, God the Son, they're one. If you say you love God, whom you have not seen, and do not love your fellow man, whom you have seen, you are a liar. Strong language for a Bible, but it's there. You are a liar. Therefore, the only one way in which you can love God is in loving man. 
inasmuch as ye have done it unto the least one of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. Why? Because I and that little one are one. Therefore, it isn't only the violation of the Ten Commandments or the Nine that bring this law down upon us, but violating this law of do unto others as you would have others do unto you, violating the law of loving your fellow man, this is the karmic law that you put in action and the one that reacts upon you. Don't blame God. God had nothing to do with it. God is love. It is ye, ye who sow, and it is ye who reap. It is ye who must choose this day whom you must serve. Nothing to do with God. It has to do with you. It has to do with me. It has to do with us individually. Now, when you understand this, there is no mystery anymore about the spiritual life. Nothing, nothing mysterious is left about it. It's as simple as this. Anytime I think anything about you that is an injustice or do anything to you that's an injustice, I have violated the law of God. If I want to live spiritually, I have only to remember one thing. Am I thinking about you as I would like you to think about me? Of course, I'm in a better position probably than you are to understand the magnitude of that statement because in my years of this work, I have become aware of the many things that have been said about me, some good and some not so good. So that I know what I would like you to think about me. I would like you, if you must, think of me or speak of me to say I'm not interested in his human good deeds or his human mistakes. I know that there is a spiritual thing working in his inner parts and uh, I respect him for that. And you may be assured of this, that's what I'm doing in my relationship to you and in my relationship to those in the prisons, when I go into the prisons to work and into the hospitals, I go in there not caring tuppence halfpenny who you are or what you are or what your human history is. Your sins may be scarlet, but that's none of my affair. That represents your ignorance of God. My function is to know this. Even those who are sinning the hardest, don't want to do it. It's against their own better nature. They're doing it for some temporary reason beyond their control or some momentary ambition. But in their heart of hearts, they wish they could go to bed at night and just fall right asleep without wondering about the wrong things they've thought or done. I know that. I know, for I've worked with so many in the prisons, I know every one of them has said, you don't think I'm really a thief, do you? You don't think I'm really a criminal, do you? In here, I want to be like you. But I haven't the education, or I didn't have the opportunity, or I got in with bad company. There are loads of human reasons. And the best thing to do is say, I don't condemn you, and I'm not even judging you. I'm merely here to tell you who you are, what you are, what your true identity is, and that you don't have to fear God. God is not going to punish you. You're under no condemnation. All you have to do is to be willing to open your eyes to something new, something different, and find your way. Now, think of this. We, with every thought we think, with every deed we do, we are sowing seeds. And we're going to reap all of them. The point for us is not to be concerned how many times we fail in this next five or ten years, 
fail in living up to our very highest, what we have to think of is the motive that animates us. Are we living up within ourselves? Are we embodying the motive to walk in a spiritual direction? If we are, that leads us home. It is very much like the subject of prayer. May I tell you this? Prayer has nothing to do with words or thoughts. There is no answer to spoken prayers or even prayers that are thought. Except, of course, in proportion to your belief, so it will be unto you. But that has nothing to do with answered prayer so far as God is concerned. God does not answer spoken prayers or prayers that are thought. The prayers that are answered are motives. When you pray, why do you pray? When you close your eyes, what have you in your mind as a motive for that prayer? Now, you don't pray idly. You have something in mind when you pray, and what is it? And if you can be honest with yourself and realize it, makes, it really makes a difference whether I'm seeking health or supply or companionship, really makes no difference what it is I, I'm seeking on this human plane. As I'm praying here, I want to experience the grace of God. I want to experience the presence of God. I want that mantle of Elijah to fall on me. I want my neighbors to be able to recognize Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. In other words, my motive isn't personal, my motive isn't selfish, my motive isn't gain. I'm going into prayer to receive God, to receive God in the innermost part of my being. If that is the motive, what words I say and what thoughts I think are of no importance. They could be the right words or the wrong words. You remember the little child who was taught in metaphysics and who had occasion to give himself a treatment one day and his parents asked him, well, what kind of a treatment did you give? How did you pray? Oh, he said, I just knew I was Papa's perfect dumbbell. <laughs> and the prayer was answered. Of course it was. It, it had nothing to do with what he said it had something to do with the realization within, well, I'm perfect, I'm part of God. I'm a child of God. The words have nothing to do with it. The words of a metaphysical treatment are less important than anything else that I know of on the face of the globe. Whether you say to an individual, you are God's perfect child, or whether you say you are the son of the devil, it won't make any difference in your treatment. The only thing that counts is, do you really believe that God is love? That's all you have to do in your treatment. If God is love, this world's well taken care of. The words you utter are of no importance. You can't imagine, can you, whether a person is in an oriental temple praying after their fashion, or a Hebrew in a Hebrew synagogue, or a Christian in a Christian church, can you imagine that that makes any difference to omnipotence, omnipresence, omniscience? Can that make any possible... Do you think there is a God that hears in English, French, Spanish, German, or Italian? You can't believe that there's a God who hears language. God is spirit, and you must worship in spirit and in truth. Now, to make prayer really wholly effective, and this likewise includes metaphysical treatment, when an individual goes into prayer or treatment with the understanding, I want to behold God's grace. My whole function is 
not just to stop John Jones' pain, not merely to get employment for Bill Smith. That isn't the main thing. Is there a God, and is God closer than breathing, and is God available now? Can God set a table in the wilderness? Then my motive in going into prayer is to behold God's grace. Oh, that I may see thee face to face. Oh, that I may witness thy grace. Oh, that I may witness thy presence. And I don't have to address my prayer or treatment to the people out here and to their names. And I don't have to tell God to take the sore from their knee or the headache from their head or the toe ache from their toe. All I have to do is realize within me, there must be a God. And that God's function must be to give me life and life more abundantly. Father, let me see that life and that life more abundant. Then it will appear as the health of my patient or my student. My concern isn't my patient or my student or my family. My concern is to know the right, to experience God's grace, to feel God's presence. And then what happens when you feel God's presence? In thy presence is fulfillment. Do you not know that even though I would not know the names of you who are here or the individual problems of you who are here, do you not know that if I meditate and I feel the presence of God here, it actually begins to dissolve the problems of your mind and body and purse? Do you not know that all we need in this room is the realized presence of God and each of us would be free without naming any names and uh, without naming any diseases or any lacks or problems? Just in thy presence is fulfillment. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And so all we have to do, as we will do in just a brief minute or two, we will close our eyes and we will not think of names and we will not think of diseases or sins or lacks. We will merely remember, in thy presence is fullness of joy. Where thy spirit is, there is release from the sins and diseases and lacks of this world. Thy grace permeating this room is a law of forgiveness unto everybody in this room. Thy presence in this room, consciously realized, is a law of forgiveness, of healing, of redemption, of resurrection. Here we are facing Easter. Are we to believe that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead 2,000 years ago and that ended the resurrection? Of what value then to us? If there was a resurrection from the dead 2,000 years ago, it was only that we might have proven to us that resurrection is a law of God. Therefore, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is resurrection. Resurrection from the tomb of sin. Resurrection from the tomb of poverty. Resurrection from the tomb of bias, bigotry, jealousy, envy, malice. Resurrection from disease and even resurrection from the grave. If it was true 2,000 years ago, it is true now. But one thing was necessary 2,000 years ago. The master had to pray and realize where God is, I am. Where I am, God is. The place whereon I stand is holy ground. Here where I am, God is. And because of that, here where I am, there is life, there is liberty, there is health, there is wholeness, there is completeness. And that is our prayer today. There is no hope for us in prayer or in metaphysical treatment except as our prayer and treatment embodies the realization that all that we are seeking is God's presence, God's grace. And then to that we discover all things are added. But do not pray for things. Do not pray for what you shall eat, 
what you'll drink. Do not pray for your bodies. Just pray for a realization of God's grace. Pray for the realization of God's presence. Realize, look, if you, make, if you, if you mount up to heaven, you'll find God. But if you make your bed in hell, you'll find God. And if you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you'll find God. So why pray for anything except the realization of God's presence? <coughs> why not make our prayer, I, God, am come, that I, Joel, may have life and have it more abundantly. And incidentally, do you know that the Master said, it profiteth you nothing to pray for your friends? Do you know that if you are not including a prayer that includes your enemies, personal or national, that you might just as well get up and stop praying? If you remember that you have ought against any man, your prayer is a waste of time. First, get up and become reconciled with thy brother. How? Let me tell you how to become reconciled with all our enemies of the past, present, or future. Acknowledge this. God is in the midst of me. God is in the midst of Moses, Jesus Christ, John, Paul. God is in the midst of me. God is in the midst of you. And now try to think if he's ever missed the Germans or the Japanese or the Russians. And you'll find out how ludicrous it must be in God's sight to hear people praying for themselves, their friends, or their allies. Unless you can acknowledge God in the midst of man, you're not praying at all just playing a game of marbles. To pray aright means this. The motive for prayer is that all men may be released from whatever is binding them. What difference whether they're bound by a false ideology or a false religion or a false color? What difference does that make, will you tell me? They're in bondage to something, and when we pray, we want all men to be forgiven, whatever it is that is holding them in bondage. Because as we look around at each other and remember that the Master said, Call no man on earth your father. There is but one Father, God. And that makes us again right back where we started, brothers and sisters. Now then, we are going to meditate and in this, please, let us draw each other into consciousness, but draw this whole world with us, not by thinking of each other or not by thinking of the world, but by realizing that God in the midst of me is the law of liberation unto every man. God in the midst of me is the law of liberation unto every man. I would like you, please to unite with all of us in this. Take from this room with you this passage. In thy presence is fullness. In thy presence is fullness. Fullness of joy, fullness of life, fullness of peace. In thy presence is fullness. And then, before you sleep tonight, Bring this back to conscious remembrance at least a half a dozen times or more. And then throughout your day tomorrow, regardless of what you're doing, not less than a dozen times or 20 times, pause for a second and remember, in thy presence is fullness. And as you do this, within a day or two or three or six you will find a change coming into your own experience merely because you have fulfilled another passage of Scripture. Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. And you will be brought into perfect peace